Anyway, uh, Jason Van Hook has agreed to show us some of the statistics that come out of all the assessment we do with our students, all the questions we ask them about their experiences, and it's really very interesting. So I won't take any more of his time, Jason and Stacy Tucker. So we're going to kind of rush through um, some data. Now what we have for you, there's no way we could possibly cover all of the data that we have on academics, and we provided this uh, for you. Basically means um, for the NESI, it's going to show you comparisons to some groups that are of interest to, to us, and for the SSI, it's actually a trend. So we've done this for the past 10 years, or really 20 years, so I've got, we've got four years worth of uh, comparisons for you. So you can see sort of the detail level questions that lead to some of the more aggregate explanations that we're going to provide. You have today. the importance ranking for each item, you have the satisfaction ranking for each item, then you see gap. Okay, so the gap then tells you where things are. If you see a negative gap, for instance, in the library, normally negative is a bad thing, but actually that's really interesting. A negative gap means they're more satisfied than they think it's important. <laughs> and so that's really good. I mean, actually, you're exceeding their expectations. I think tutoring had one of those as well. So there aren't many of these, but but that's a good sign. And so um, all, like Stacy said, just these students in general, just I don't know if they tend to acquiesce or what, but they just tend to be more satisfied, feel more engaged. Hopefully that's a reflection of us, right? But um, so you kind of just have to dig in for information. Hey, we're just two people. We like doing this kind of stuff, but it's endless and we have limited time. And so I know a lot of you like doing this too. So we wanted to get this information out to you. If you identify things that we've missed or didn't mention, you know, use that information. That's what this is for. We spent a lot of time and a lot of money trying to collect this. But, um, you know, we'd love to have discussions with you, but use this in your departments. Use this maybe in the next discussion or in future discussions. So we've got about uh, 20 minutes. Um, I have lots of data on retention. I want to explain to you what we've done. Um, we, this has been a work in progress. I don't know when we started this, maybe five years ago. Um, I think around 2008, actually, when, when retention was all of a sudden a big uh, issue for us and we were wondering what was going on. We collected some data. We've done all kinds of different approaches to trying to figure out how can we, or how, how can we see if students are succeeding or not and, and why. We've tried really complex predictive modeling techniques, progression uh, techniques. We've tried simple things. This was a simple thing where we said, we, know, we think there are just clear single variables that might predict a particular outcome. And if we looked at those in isolation, maybe we can see some patterns. And if we can see some patterns, then maybe we could take those different things that might make someone at risk, these patterns, and combine them together and then apply that to a cohort and see how well that predicts whether they succeed or not. So it was sort of a multi-step process. We're still in it, but we're seeing some really interesting data. And so I wanted to share that with you today. These variables, these single variable analyses, deal with demographic variables, financial variables, mostly financial aid, and academic variables. So, again, a really simple technique, not really heavy stats. What we did is we took each category, for instance, gender, male, female, and we said, in a cohort, our last one was the freshman class of 2011, how many of them came back in 2012? And if a particular grouping, males, were less than our average, which is around 72%, but it depends on the year. Last year it was 73%. If they were less than our average, we highlighted them in yellow. So as a visual way of recognizing this is a potential at-risk group. If they're not, we highlighted them in gray. 
Okay, this is not really sophisticated stats, but it's more of a visual representation, something that we all can understand. And then we went through and looked at all the yellows and said, what would we be concerned with? You know, if it's 71%, yeah, that's less than 72, but, you know, maybe if it's less than a certain level, we could classify that as at risk. So after the fact, we looked at it and said, you know, 67% or so seems to be a unique group that we can, we can isolate. And so we identified those groups, and then we ran that up against the population. Some, some students belong to multiple factors. And we then tried to see, if you had two factors, how likely are you to return? If you had five factors, how likely are you to return? Again, really kind of simple stats, but it ends up being quite impressive. And so that's what we wanted to show to you today. So demographic variables, hope I teed this up to, uh, so you can understand what you're looking at here. Demographic variables, the top one's male, female. What you see there is the 2011 <laughs> cohort, but we have four years worth of this, okay? So when you see multi-year trend, that is a four-year trend, okay? Now, the, the, the number here which determines whether it's gray or yellow varies year by year because we're actually using that year's average, and so don't worry about that. Just see if it's gray, they're above that sort of multi-year trend. If it's yellow, it's something to think about. The very first one I looked at was gender, and I said, oh my goodness. Look how different those numbers are. And so I don't know that that's shocking to you, but it is, a, it is definitely something, right? And so our male students are 67% likely to return the second year. Um, why? So it's, we don't have time to answer that question, but <laughs> when you look at age, we had the full breakdown, but it's not necessary because what you can look at is the 16, 17, and 18-year-olds, that traditional sort of population, 17 and 18, 78%, 72%. How about our 16-year-olds? 76%, 77, really. But then the 19-year-olds, and the 20 plus year olds, then it drops quite significantly. Okay, so you see in yellow, we just kind of highlighting groups that might be an issue. Um, admit status. Okay, so every student who starts at Lee gets an admission status. We count students this way. It's really important to, to us and how we analyze our enrollment trends. BFC means beginning freshman with credit. These students came to Lee straight from high school and already had college credit, so dual enrolled AP, etc. BFR students came straight from high school, no college credit. Okay? That's interesting. 80% retention rate of students who took at least one college class before they attended, attended Lee. 69% or 70% for students who didn't. INF, International Freshman, we'll look more at that later. OFC, OFR, these students didn't come straight from high school, but they've never been to college after they graduated high school. Okay, that's kind of confusing, right? Because the OFCs were dual enrolled high school students that for some reason didn't come straight here, but they've never really been anywhere else. They do have some college credit, but not from college. Uh, it was all prior to graduating. There's very few of those. But if you look at the OFRs, these people are at 63%. And so some demographic variables. What about ethnicity? Well, it's kind of all over the board a little bit. It's probably not what you would expect. Um, some of the, the counts are low, so it's hard to make a decision about something when you only have five students, right? So don't... You know, you don't want to read too much into, like, for, a, the, for instance, the Asian Indian category. These are federal classifications here. Um, you know, there were only two students. So, but if you look, you know, at the traditional groupings or the groupings that have more students than others, I, I don't think there's cause for major concern in, in any of these areas. Um, 
alien status. It's an interesting term, right? But <laughs> I don't call, I don't name these things. So um, basically, are they U.S. permanent resident or are they um, U.S. citizen? Then the answer is no. Everybody else says yes. And you see again, there is sort of a difference here, but I think maybe less of a difference than than one would expect. We actually then went and looked by country, but I can't give you all that data because it's just too much, and there's really small s samples of, of each group. Um, but if you look in there, again, it's just all over the board. And so um, we moved on to academic variables. Okay, so these are the ones you're probably most interested in. Um, so every incoming student who's a BFR, a BFC, OFR, OFC, those groups, we require ACT score. Okay, and you can group them in a, in a number of different ways. Um, one way we group them in our mind is what scholarship level they're at. Um, so centennials, presidentials, deans, not a scholar but not probation, probation. And if you look at that, it's just, you know, bam, right in your face, right? You see centennials, 90%. Last year it was 94% returned. They should. They've got a full ride four years, right? Okay, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but we have seen for four years straight the presidential scholars return at a lower rate than deans. Why? Because we had a full tuition scholarship for the first year and then nothing for presidentials. <laughs> deans have tuition scholarship for the first year and then nothing, but they can get a half tuition ongoing if they get the honor scholarship. So could the presidentials. But we think that burden of all and then nothing is too great mentally for them that they're hoping probably that they make the 3-7 and can make it where the deans have already sort of made the decision that, yeah, we can make this financial commitment we changed the presidential scholarship because of this number. And so um, this year, the presidential scholars get 9,000 the first year and then 6,000 the second. And so they were told this up front and we're really anxious to see what happens over the next year with this group. But um, probation or non-probation, I think this is a little better than I was expecting, maybe better than some of you were, were expecting, but uh, this this is a small group, people who entered Lee who wound up on probation after the first year. Okay, so it's not a big sample or a big group, but um, here's the numbers. Look at ACT score by ACT score, and it's really interesting information here. Um, I thought, you know, around the 18 would be where you'd see sort of a marked difference, but it's not. It's actually around the 21 range. So 21 and below, it's pretty much across the board yellow. 22 and above, pretty much across the board gray. Now let me just say, it isn't our mission to serve all of these students. And the easy way to fix our retention problem is to not admit any students under 21, but that's not what we want to do, right? And so we want to serve these students. We talk, we keep talking about student success. Well, here's a group of students that we want to help succeed, right? How can we do that? I don't think the answer is not to have them, but it's what do we do with them now that we know they're different than these other students, right? So I'm not showing SAT because most of our students take the ACT, and the SAT is kind of not as clear as this, but 80% of our students take this test. I'm moving really fast because we're running out of time. High school GPA, here's another interesting stat. It was, this yellow showed up lower than I thought it would. Three, five, and below. There's a very distinct difference between those, right? So students that have a 3.5 and above, this is high school GPA, 81%, 85% retention rates. Below that, 66, 59, 52, 51, 40. That's just going straight down, isn't it? And so that tells us something. 
High school rank, same thing. You don't see numbers like this. You know, once it, once we had them all in front of us, I was like, oh my gosh. High school rank, same thing. So you see all the yellows just clumped in there together. Where's that break? Well, you know, I think 70s maybe not too bad there, but 31 and below, um, you know, you're 64, 67. And it doesn't seem to change from there. It's kind of flat, right? Um, but there's definitely something that happens from 31% and down. We are going to find a way to provide you, if you teach Gateway, with a roster that tells you how many demographic risk factors, how many academic risk factors, and how many financial risk factors the student has. We're not going to tell you what they are, because some of that's personal information, but if there are six academic risk factors that incoming students would have, we'll show you how many of them they have. It'll be like, you know, a check mark or something. So that you will know, hey, I need to focus on the, on this student. So, And there's other things we, we can do. I, I would love to have that conversation. College GPA. All right, well, this wouldn't help Gateway students because you don't know their college GPA. But you can see that, you know, I would say below a 2.5, you're going to start seeing significant decline in, in retention. Um, and then it happens again at to 2.0. And so, um, well, really it happens again all the way down, right? So it's kind of stair-stepping. And then another way of looking at this, and it's something that we came up with later, was if you take the completed credit ratio, so a student attempts a certain amount of hours, what percent of those do they actually complete with a grade that's not an F or a W? And you can see that percentage breakdown, you know, 80% seems to be a pretty magic number there. And so, again, none of, I mean, I guess it's not rocket science here. I mean, you would guess that that's probably true, but to see exactly where that changes is useful to us because then I, I know that break mark and I can apply that then to a cohort and predict with some confidence, you know, what level of retention this person is likely to have and so we did this with financial data I'm going to run through this quick because this isn't exactly why we're here anyway um, and you can see we t did EFC estimated family contribution how much we think a parent can pay towards the education unmet need total grants total loans total aid and other categories and with that then I went through and and said, what's that magic number? And I said 67%. Why? Because I was in control. So, I don't know. I, just, I looked at it and said, that looks like a good number. Okay? I mean, it's just me saying what looked like a good number. So, I had that number in mind, and I grabbed out every grouping of people that sort of had some sub, a substantial number. Right? So, I didn't want to grab a group that had two people in it. But you can see groups here that are pretty large in size, and then some of them would cause a student to be in two groups, right? So less than a 2.5 and less than a 2.0, will people less than a 2.0 have less than a 2.5, right? So in some cases, some people would belong to two categories, and so, um, but I marked them anyway. And then what we did is applied this up against that same group, and I said, what student has zero factors? What's, how many students have one factor? How many students have two factors? And then recalculated their retention. And this is what we received. The number of factors total, the number of demographic factors, the number of academic factors, and the number of financial factors. And the person who helped me like red and green better than yellow and gray, so... In this particular case, it's a different coloring scheme. But you can see that in sum, students that have at least four of these factors, there's a difference in retention than, than, the or, uh, than our average grouping, right? And then if you start looking at specifically demographic, there were four 
or there are three demographic variables that we used in this particular case. Um, or actually there were more, but you could only, the, the max number of factors anyone had was three. And you can see that just having one of those sort of separated from the nothing and then everything else um, from there just sort of stair-stepping. Academic, students that have at least two factors, put them below the average group. And then financial, the same thing. And so our next goal here then would be to use this information in sort of a predictive way and to provide you back with information on students that we think might be at risk. This is the concept of an early alert strategy, but it's sort of homegrown. There are a lot of other tools out there that would be helpful alongside this, but um, that's basically it. We're at our time limit, and I hope that this is interesting. I hope that this is useful to you. Um, this will lead into a ne the next discussion. I invite you to stay. I'm sure they invite you to stay, but... Um, and I want to have continued conversations about this movie as well in the future. But thanks for coming at 8.